Hello friends. So yesterday we saw Matthew Arnold as a critic. So he is known better as a critic than a poet because we saw that uh, of the three great Victorian poets, first is uh, Alfred Tennyson and second Robert Browning and third uh, Matthew Arnold, although he was appointed the Oxford Professor of Poetry. Uh, we have already seen that as Oxford Professor of Poetry, he was the first to deliver his lectures in English. And then second point we saw, he has got, he said, future of poetry is immense. It's a great value to poetry. Higher destiny of poetry. The third point we saw is the father of modern criticism, also the founding father of academic criticism. Father of modern criticism, so he influenced great critics like T.S. Eliot, then uh, you also saw uh, Cleon Brook, Cleon Brook and T.S. Eliot and so on. So great critics, Harold Bloom and so on. And then we saw that uh, he wrote extensively on contemporary issues. So religion, education, culture, and uh, these are the important social, uh, social, yes. So according to him, his definition of culture is very famous and a little bit notorious also because later on you can see when we take up Raymond Williams, he says that culture is ordinary because it's because uh, Matthew Arnold has said that culture is something high. That is the best that is thought, said, thought and said. The best that is thought and said. That is the definition given by Matthew Arnold. And then he said, that, you know, poetry is the criticism of life. Criticism of life, please don't misunderstand that he is going to, that, criti that the poet should uh, list one by one the, uh, the faults of life. No, it is interpretation. Poetry interprets life, it's the interpretation of life and not the criticism, don't take it that way. So the, therefore he said the poetry should be the best. Criticism, they said the interpretation should be best. Understand? And uh, we also thought that uh, this piece, that is, this is an introduction written to uh, it Watts, the English poets, isn't it? And we also saw. So, and again it came out in Essays in Criticism, second series. Okay. So now what? Well, so one now three or four more points by way of introduction, so that we can get into this. You may ask me, why do you have two introductions? <laughs> See, the first one I told you about a general one that is, uh, according to him, the most important point according to him is a higher destiny. Human race will find its consolation and stay in poetry in future. All the other things will disappear. Science will disappear. Religion will disappear. Philosophy will disappear. Or these things are under attack. Philosophy we have already seen in us. That is, logocentric Western philosophy is already under attack. Okay. Now, there are four more points you should know about uh, before we enter with the essay proper. Although these points will be, we'll uh, explain it further. First one is that uh, the higher destiny of the po po higher destiny of poetry demands higher order of excellence. That's very important. And you said that higher higher destiny higher destiny demands. This is one demands. Higher order of excellence. Higher order of excellence. See, for example, you can see in your class, if you have got a first rank student, we expect something very high from him. Therefore, we expect that he behaves, his way of presentations, his study, his study habits, etc., is very of a high level. Otherwise, not an inferior uh, student or a person, we don't expect such a thing. But when we, ex when we expect 
higher order, brilliant from a student, if he behaves in an inferior way, we will, we will feel very sad. So the poets, they have got a very high moral duty. Understand? They have got a moral duty to interpret, interpret life. And therefore, you, we also demand a higher order of excellence. That's point one. And second point is, says, since we expect a higher order of excellence, there shall be no scope for charlatanism. Charlatanism. What is this charlatanism? Means mediocre. Mediocre. See? Or inferior. You can say charlatanism is a, what we say is a, a kind of um, uh, it's, it hides so to say. Charlatanism, it, it confuses and hides the distinction between excellent and inferior. It's a kind of what we say, fishing in troubled waters. Charlatanism as such, the concept is, it hides the distinction, it confuses the distinction between uh, the higher excellent and the inferior. For example, if you allow charlatanism to enter your marking, let's say, you are uh, giving, giving your, uh, say, grade marks to your students, I am also a teacher, our student, that is including myself, I am saying. So then what will happen is, if charlatanism enters, then they, we will be confused. Understand? And this, this approach uh, hides the real merit from us. So we will sometimes consider the inferior as the better. There is a confusion is created. Hides the inferior, inferior uh, the inf uh, inferior order, so we can say, inferior order, yes. So charlatanism confuses and hides the distinctions between the excellent and the inferior, distinction between and other. So whatever, your mind is confused, or you will be, someday you will be misunderstood, you will, uh, you will be led astray by some other considerations. See that? That is charlatanism. So confusion, hiding what is excellent and what is inferior. You are unable to. So you are in a in a situation where you are in a dilemma. So you can say. So because sometimes what happens, some friendship will uh, miscarry. miscarry. See, suppose you are a friend of you are a, one of the students is your best friend. Then this charlatanism can come in, isn't it? Ah. He is my best friend, so maybe, okay, this, this is all right. So you will say like that, that kind of attitude. More of this we will see tomorrow, but time being you understand, it is confusion. Charlatanism creates a confusion and it hides, it obliterates. That is what Mahathya uh, it obliterates. I have just uh, changed that we have to hide to make things easier, <laughs> easier for you. The distinctions between Excellence and the inferior. What is excellent and inferior? I think that is a clear thing. All right. Okay. Then a third point is he is batting for real estimate. Real estimate of poetry. It says a real estimate in the context that possibility historic fallacies is. There is a fallacy called historic fallacy, other is a personal fallacy. Personal. So these to, in fact, it is connected to charlatanism, isn't it? Personal fallacy. Historic fallacy is, you know, some days what you may think that in the development of literature, a particular person has, a particular poet has given great contribution, made great contribution to literature. And then you will say, ah, he is the best. Because you are not taking into consideration those who came after him. The beginning of the development of the language and literature of a particular language, if somebody has made a great contribution, immediately you will say, ah, historically he is great. You say like, 
That is the historic, historic, historic fallacy. An example is that of Chaucer. Now, you, you, when you probably might have, when you are preparing for the essay, examination, for the purpose of examination, you will say, you will write like this one. High probability expressions like this, Chaucer is the father of poetry, is the father of short story, is the father of novel, is the father of characterization, is the father of comedy, is the father of tragedy, is the father of many things. But, in come to <coughs> Matthew Arnold. I don't say that his Matthew Arnold's assessment is perfect, but he says he is not a classic. Joseph is not a classic because he says as his, there is no seriousness in him. There is no high seriousness in him. He has written Olympias. See, his, his writings are Olympias. And he has made contribution. As you can see, Margaret Schlock, remember when I was giving lectures on the development of English language, history of the English language, you know, he said, no. It was Margaret Schlock in, his, in her book, uh, uh, the English. English in modern in, in the modern times, you know, it is uh, she has said made a, a, a statement like this. Not only did Chaucer, uh, not only did, did Chaucer choose to write in the in the that is uh, in the infant language, but <coughs> but he also. <coughs> <coughs> he also sorry, endowed it with all the graces that he learned from, that he brought from Italian and French literature. The developing literature of Italy and France. So historically he has made a great contribution to the development and growth of English language. But poetry, he is not, he is not given the rank as is given to other position as is given to Dandy, Homer, Dandy, Shakespeare, or Milton. So that is the difference. There you have got a historic fallacy. Personal fallacy, of course, we have seen in Pope when we were discussing Pope. Essay, his essay in criticism, we have seen now that the critics should not go along with the opinion of the town. That is personal fallacy. Is that ah, all the people are saying like this? Okay, so you must be able. That shouldn't be like that. So, therefore, he bats for real estimate of a poetry. Why? Because poetry has got the immense future. Poetry is uh, poetry has got a high destiny. Therefore, don't play with poetry. When you are judging, your evaluation and judgment should be so perfect that it should be, there should be no trace of historic or personal fallacy. There are more of this we will see later, but I am just giving you a kind of what a warning that these are the things that we are going to. And then the fourth and the most probably, you, Matthew Arnold is by, uh, known by, known by uh, this term, touchstone method, touchstone. Touchstone method simply means comparative method. Comparative. So he compares. So here this is very important. No? Because he says, he can see the, the seeds of T.S. Eliot's statement. What is the word is there? He said that he, according to T.S. Eliot, he said, Touchstone method, what is in? He said, pastness of the past. That concept. And then he says, Past, the present, the present should be directed by the past, and the past should be altered by the present. That is touchstone method, more than what comparative method. The past, the present should be directed by the past. That means compare the past and the present like this. Listen, when you are writing, making an attempt to write this, the mind of Europe. For the pastness of the past, for the uh, literature of Europe till then, that should be with you. With you means not that in your library, but you should always be comparing it with your work. Okay, that is touchstone method. Then what will happen is, this, by applying this touchstone method, 
and whether you have created a better work or not. That is, present should be directed by the past. Then what will happen? You alter the past. The canons you change. Your work will have so much of great power to change the canon, the established canon. That is what is meant by saying past is past should or person person should be directed by the past and uh, uh, the past should be altered by the person. One is directed, the other alters. So that is the combative test method. So that is seed of what the seeds of the modern traditional individual talent you will find in Matthew. That's what I'm, I, 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 I'm, that's what I am trying to tell you. Understood? And the touchstone poets are Homer, Dandy, Shakespeare, and Milton. Not Chaucer. Because Chaucer is not serious. That's what he says. He's not serious. See? And uh, another very interesting thing is that when you say about real estimate, again you find uh, the, uh, the, that statement, famous statement made by T.S. Eliot, no? what did he say? What did he say? Honest criticism and sincere appreciation should be directed not on the, upon the poet, but upon the poetry. Not upon the poet. So don't be, don't be misled or don't be misguided or don't be influenced by the biography of the poet or the contributions that he, that he made till that date. Don't do any such thing, but take the real estimate. Really, the real estimate is the mo the modern concept of criticism. Real estimate. So you have got the new criticism. What do what do the new critics say? And that is why we say that he is the founder of modern criticism. The new critics also say the same. The new criticism, so to say, the our criticism should be appreciation should be directed not to the poet or the situation or the social milieu or any other consideration, but take the real estimate that is the poem, the, the text, the poem itself. What is the what the poem has to say? How does the poem create tensions? How does the poem resolve these tensions? Poem or any work of art for that matter. So we can see that why do we say a question can be asked again, like, why do we say that uh, Matthew Arnold is the father of modern criticism or academic criticism? That because it is his concept of real estimate of poetry. So it is from real estimate of poetry and trust on method that, she, that it, T.S. Eliot has taken these concepts like uh, honest, honest criticism and sincere appreciation should be directed not upon the poet but upon the poetry. Also, pastness, past person should be directed by the past and past is altered by the person. What more you want to, to support your answer that is, he is the father of modern criticism. I think now it's clear. And many passages is quotes. One of the passages for uh, classic, as a passage is taken from a classic poet. Or you can say one of the, uh, one of the passages that, that is that exemplifies the higher order of excellence of poetry is the last words of Hamlet that he quotes in this essay. And as you can see now, you have seen now, this, he, Hamlet tells Horatio, if thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, if thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, and then he says, absent thee from felicity away, and in this harsh world, draw thy breath, draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. A grand classic. That's what is it. Once again, that is, if thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, that is, he is telling Hamlet, tells his best friend, that is his last wish, his best friend Horatio, he says, if thou didst hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity away, and draw thy breath, and draw thy breath in pain. And in this harsh world, sorry, 
and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story the last words of the philosopher prince the philosopher prince that is that is uh, the, and the philosopher prince who told uh, horatio before that he, there are more things in heaven and earth horatio than that are dreamt of in your philosophy so the prince is a philosopher his friend is a philosopher and such passages so the great classics you say classics so that is what he says the higher order of poetry in such an order there is no scope for charlatanism in such an order you can that that order will alter the persons see that and there is there can be the historic estimate or or personal estimate will have absolutely no scope to end up in such poetry so this is what he says poetry should be like this understand so the higher destiny of poetry demands a higher order of excellence since the higher destiny of poetry demands higher order of excellence there is no it has to be classic like the passage that i have just quoted from says from shakespeare therefore he says the touchstone poet compare this classics compare that is the way to judge make judgment on a work of art not personal not historical not charlatanism i hope with this uh this introduction is over now we will start taking point one one point and explain that then after which we will take the second point then third point so point after point we will take and then explain that will anyway it is going to be a, i tell you if you are uh, really interested in criticism literature and evaluation and judgment and so on matthew arnold is one of the best foundations you slave the foundations of modern criticism and rightly earn the title as the father of modern criticism there is absolutely no doubt about that may not be a great poet but even may not be a great a great professor because about madhya arnold it is said that his manners were awkward and he was inaudible i don't know whether these are true or not some people Uh, they find fault with the, even uh, the Himalayas, no? <laughs> that's the thing. See, so the uh, paragon of paragon of virtue. If you find some people will say, ah, there is such and such a false in it. Now people will say, don't worry about such kind of things. Go ahead. Listen, we will not we will not be uh, our spirits will not be uh, will will not be paralyzed just because some people have said this or that. so let us once again uh, affirm the fact that matthew arnold is the father of modern criticism okay so with this the introductory part is over now we will take point up point one by one points one by one and then we will describe i mean try to explain these things what is charlatanism what is historic fallacy what is personal fallacy what is trustone method and he is known for that and now whatever whatever whenever there is an exam or an evaluation season then the, this is a sure question so what is meant by trustone method we will see that later and then till then bye have a nice day enjoy you